go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ask Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's Director of Personnel. We're happy that you could join us for this episode of Ask Anything because today we're talking with another two of our own, our Vice President of, for our Data and Analytics Division, Adrian Watts, and the Director of Strategy for our Data and Analytics Division, Cody Friend. We're going to be talking with them about how AI can enhance jobs and productivity. Adrian Watts is Vice President of Data and Analytics for Mosher Consulting. Adrian brings over 20 years of experience leveraging data to drive business growth and innovation. She has worked with a diverse range of clients, including large Fortune 500 companies, small to medium businesses, and nonprofit organizations. As a thought leader, she enjoys partnering with clients to develop the organization's strategy, helping them gain value from their data and transform noise into narrative via data visualization and advanced analytics. Adrian has a passion for leveraging AI and machine learning to improve the human experience and automate processes. Her role at Mosher provides the opportunity to partner with all kinds of organizations, helping them unravel the potential within their data and achieve measurable results. Adrian has a bachelor's degree in computer science from DePaul University, a master's in business administration from Anderson University, and a commitment to continuous learning as demonstrated through continuing education and certifications, including MIT's professional education program, studying machine learning and applied statistics for data science. No matter where you are in your DNA journey, just beginning to think about exploring options and unsure of where to start or well advanced with a dedicated team, she welcomes the conversation. Reach out to chat about strategies and opportunities in this dynamic field. Cody Friend is a talented strategist and data expert with over a decade of experience in various industries. As the Director of Strategy and Data Analytics at Mosher Consulting, he leads a team of professionals in delivering innovative solutions for clients in industries ranging from healthcare to finance. Prior to joining Mosher, Cody worked as a data engineer for a large regional bank where he honed his technical skills and developed a deep understanding of the role that it plays in business strategy. He also spent six years in higher education working for both public and private universities where he helped to shape the next generation of professionals. Cody earned his MBA with a concentration in finance from Anderson University, where he developed a comprehensive understanding of financial strategy and management. He also holds a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science, which has been instrumental in his success in the field of data and analytics. So before we begin, let's uh, welcome our guests, Adrian and Cody. How are you guys? Hi, thanks for having us here today. Yeah, doing well, thank you. Well, I certainly appreciate you both being with us today. I feel like we've been on an AI nonstop episode recording for us lately, which I really like because I really enjoy this topic. And the topic today really interests me a lot because now we're talking about enhancing positions and how AI can help people in their positions and how it can really enhance their skill set as well, because it just it's going to give them some time and and some really some good thinking space so that they can do other things and maybe just not worry about a lot of things like we do now or before we we had AI. So let's dive into this topic. How is AI currently being used to augment human capabilities in the workplace rather than simply replacing them? Yeah, this is a great question to start with. I think contrary to some social media content and news articles that we've seen out there, um, AI is not replacing jobs. So there's been a little bit of fear about it. it's going to replace jobs. In reality, AI is a tool that's going to enrich jobs. It's going to improve efficiency to expand the knowledge that people can have at their fingertips. AI empowers our capabilities and augments performance by providing a greater tool, just making data available in a really quick amount of time to a lot of employees. So we can share a variety of use cases today across both technical and non-technical roles. We work for an IT consulting company. So the technical aspects of this are something that we leverage every day, but AI is having a powerful impact on all kinds of roles across all industries. So Cody and I are going to share some use cases and examples to just highlight benefits across all those roles. The first one that comes to mind, how can jobs be empowered with AI? Software engineers and data engineers, developers, roles with the responsibility to create code. So AI can be very powerful in that space. It can be used to write new code, to optimize existing code, to document code functionality. And this one is significant because not many engineers really enjoy creating documentation. <laughs> Most organizations face challenges with not having enough documentation or struggle to keep it current. So this is a strong fit for AI to analyze the code, to both create and update the documentation. That being said, it's not going to replace the need for our engineers. 
AI is super strong at doing kind of low level rinse and repeat functionality. It can do a great first draft of some things, but there's a McKinsey study that shows that some coding tasks can be done with a 50% efficiency gain, but if it's highly complex, if they're newer in their careers, like then you're not going to see the same benefits from AI. So we still need our humans to know what the desired outputs are to evaluate the contents that that's bad, that from appropriately, some training and upskilling there and how it integrates with the rest of the, the program as well. So a lot of data there from Harvard Business Review and McKinsey studies about what types of benefits you'll get in different categories when you're generating code. Another use case would be creating data sets for testing. So we don't have to manually create data. We can just very quickly say, you know, enter into our prompt AI. I need hundred thousand records with, you know, this kind of boundaries and the, these kinds of fields, et cetera. And so you can very rapidly iterate through some testing, dev and test environments for different use cases. And the final use case I want to share around technical roles would be our data visualization teams. And so that's uh, report developers, dashboarding, people who work in Tableau and Power BI. There have been some new products getting some content and coverage recently where you can share your visualization and it will give you feedback and do a quick evaluation or assessment and, and some feedback on how maybe you can improve that visualization. So that's very impactful for our technical audience. I think just piggybacking off of what you were saying before, Adrian, AI is not here to replace our people and our jobs. I read an article recently that talked about this new revolution that we're looking at with you know AI. And it's going to be very similar to the revolution that we had with electricity right? It didn't completely do away with people. The internet didn't do away with people, but it helped us, you know, move forward. This article I read talked about how AI is going to help our workforce very much like the personal computer did. I think there were a lot of fears when PCs came out that we're going to just do away with people entirely. Really what we used a PC for was to make our smart people better and faster and more productive at their work. And that's kind of what we're looking to do with AI. Adrian talked about some of the technical use cases. There's a lot of non-technical use cases that can help any employee. Some of those could be the generation of meeting notes. Nobody likes taking meeting notes. 10 people in the meeting Meeting, whole bunch of different topics are covered. Who's taking notes? There's tools out there right now. Microsoft Copilot's a big one right now. And you can plug that into your Microsoft Teams environment and it will automatically take meeting notes. It'll summarize the conversations that are had. And you can actually interact with the AI directly in the meeting. And it'll tell you, hey, these are the questions that have been asked. Here's a summarization of all the topics. And even during the meeting, it'll tell you, here's some of the questions that still haven't been answered by the larger group. So that's very impactful from a non-technical perspective. I also yeah. saw in some of the newer Copilot articles online that not just for meeting notes and action items, but it can kind of real-time stream analytics to you, such as what follow-up questions should I ask? What topics are unresolved? What are some holes in the argument? that was just presented. Or you could prompt something like create a table summarizing the ideas discussed and their pros and cons. So wow. in real time, you can leverage this technology to really move the meeting forward. That's going to be very impactful for any industry. Some other things that we're seeing for non-technical users are content generation, right? Mm -hmm. Most people have to create some sort of document. We can use generative AI to come in and help us create the baseline for a document. It may not be the final draft, but it could be that first draft to get you past, you know, the writer's block that most people have. Uh, we're also seeing it being used with drafting emails. There's some tools that can be plugged into Microsoft Outlook and it can tell you some sentiment analysis. You know, maybe you're being too aggressive in your emails and you need to tone that down. Maybe you need to be more sympathetic. Maybe you're missing, you know, some of the key points it can analyze your email and provide, you know, recommendations. And then finally, another use case that we're seeing, uh, we recently had a client that we talked with and they were looking for a use case for translating. So they had a large percentage of their population that was Spanish speaking and most of their workforce um, spoke English. They have all this documentation in one language and their users are using it in a different language. Hmm. How do they easily translate documents from one language to another. And they were looking to use AI for that. 
So very impactful, very quick and easy for their company to just translate a document and empower some users. Yeah, I want to say a couple of things. First, where can I get the email tool? I, I need that. And I feel like a lot of people in many organizations are going to need that. So we probably need to put that out there somehow. Um, <laughs> and second, the language aspect, I talked about that with somebody who I recorded an episode not too long ago about how AI can be used to really be a powerful translator. We We talked about in the context of learning a language or maybe maybe even just polishing those old skills. Because I use the example, I, I learned French about 12, 14 years ago because I wanted to make myself more marketable because I was going for a position that was out in Belgium. And so I wanted to speak French and make sure that I could speak the language, et cetera. But right now, my skill set in speaking is terrible. Reading, it's actually, I would say, about the same as it was from 12 years ago. So I would love to have a tool that I can actually have a conversation or where I can learn to really hear the sounds because obviously every language has a different connotation when you speak, how you use your tongue, et cetera. There's many different factors to that, but I can hear French. I can understand it. I just can't speak it. So it's a powerful tool, but I, I'm glad that you brought that example about using that to translate documents for their population because that is a powerful tool. I mean, think about that. You would have probably had to bring somebody in that spoke Spanish that then had to sit down and look at the document and transcribe that in Spanish and make sure that the syntax is correct, the, the context within the message was correct. So it's a very powerful tool. And I want to also go back to something that really segues to the next question that Adrian mentioned about repetitive tasks. This can help you with repetitive tasks, but I'll let Adrian and or Cody answer this question. How can AI or how might AI help jobs that are repetitive in nature? Yes, yeah, so I think some ways that we can help with you know, repetitive jobs wouldn't just necessarily be focused on AI, but just automation in general. Mm. I think there's a lot of different tools that we can use, whether it is AI, whether it's a tool like an RPA tool, or just some sort of process automation to help with repetitive tasks. We walk into a lot of companies and you know, start walking through some of the processes that people are doing, and you find out there's pain points along the way. It may not just be the final byproduct, hey, I need this splashy dashboard, I need this data moved from A to B. A lot of the times the pain points are in the data collection. So sometimes you can work with you know, a company, build a process automation, and it can take some of the manual tasks that people are doing and fully automate that. Mm -hmm. An example uh, we've seen with some of our clients, some clients don't have tools to extract data. A lot of systems offer APIs and you can export data from one system to another. Not every tool has that. In some systems, it still requires people to log in manually, log in, check a box, navigate to a different screen, check three or four boxes, hit the export function. When they export, it's dropping a file to an Excel format. They're copying that Excel file from their desktop, moving it to a different folder, and then sending that off to somebody else. It's a very repetitive task. And if you're doing that multiple times a day for multiple organizations, that adds up pretty quickly. So with a lot of this process automation, you can actually go through, build some bots to do that work for you. It can log in, click the buttons that a person would have clicked and have a very repeatable process, taking the people out of the monotonous task and getting them focused on stuff that they actually want to do. Yeah, that's true. A lot of times when we talk about AI, we've been calling it AI and automation, right? So AI definitely, generative AI definitely adds a lot of value on some of the things that we've highlighted today about the repetitive tasks as well, but that's not the only technology that's surging. So thank you, Cody, for highlighting also just other forms of automation. I also read an article recently about AI will enhance roles. And the key takeaway was that while, you know, it will help us gain efficiency by automating repetitive tasks, it really won't replace the core of that role itself, right? So if we step back and evaluate jobs, you can break each job title or role down into a list of the tasks performed or types of the tasks performed. And then we can analyze how AI might affect each one of those tasks individually. And the results are usually going to land in one of four 
categories, right? Some of those tasks are going, to, are going to remain unchanged. They'll continue to be performed by humans entirely. Some of those tasks are going to be fully automated through AI or other automation. So those are kind of the things that we hinted at today, the repetitive things, the first draft of things, and some of that. The third bucket there would be the tasks which can be augmented to help humans work more effectively or more efficiently. And the fourth category are the new tasks which are emerging as a result of AI. Right now we need this new level of oversight, maintenance, governance, as well as improving the performance of the AI itself. So we'll need people to find new ways to retrain the algorithm, tag the metadata so it knows what the desired outputs are. And so at the end of the day, um, that higher order cognitive work, moral reasoning, innovation, that's still very much going to live with people. So, and I think most people are going to be very enthusiastic about this, right? The, the stuff that we have to do every day that's repetitive and tedious is not really where most people get their sense of fulfillment and their enjoyment. So we can right. offload some of those things and uh, gain that efficiency. That's a very real measurable ROI for most companies and most, most roles. And now our people are freed up. Um, to do the more value, valuable, higher thinking parts of their job. As you mentioned, it leads to efficiency and it leads to a better job satisfaction overall, because you're right. Most people hate the repetitiveness or some of, some of their tasks in their daily work. And so AI can certainly help enhance that in that it might take away some of that repetitiveness or it can enhance that a little bit better. So maybe it's a little bit more enjoyable instead of just, oh God, I got to go through these 20 steps all over again every time I start XYZ process. And that is where job satisfaction comes in because then it makes people happier. It makes them want to actually be there to perform that job. And so it just makes it better all the way around, plain and simple. So let's talk about Mosher because we are using AI. So how is Mosher using AI? We are doing a lot of the little things that we talked about today, right? With analyzing our email and creating content and leveraging a lot of powerful tools that are already on the market. So you don't have to hire a team of data scientists to leverage some of these tools and just everybody's daily workflow. But additionally, we have two big projects that we're working on. And so one is a content analyzer, an LLM implementation where uh, we can point our prompt interface at a large repository of documents. So I think a lot of organizations face this challenge where you have hundreds, if not thousands of documents available to your employees. They're stored in SharePoint or OneDrive or Confluence or a variety of places, whatever your document management system of choice is. And how do we find that document from 10 or 12 years ago that has that nugget of information, area of specialty, et cetera, or... Mosher constantly writes for RFPs, right? So we have a large volume of previous RFP content that we can analyze. Why do we have to rewrite it from scratch every single time? Right. Um, so we're doing our own implementation on that. So you can put in the prompt using your natural language, you know, the, give me a success story or past performance at the time where we migrated from Azure to AWS for this particular data infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. And it's going to go scan all the times in the past that maybe we've written other relative content, et cetera, so that you can get that first rough draft out pretty quickly, right? We still need our experts mm -hmm. to analyze that and, and put the polish on and iterate on it, but you can get a lot of content generated really quickly in that way. And I know Cody has talked to a couple of clients with use cases. Cody, are you able to share any of that? Yeah. So I, I think some of the clients we're talking to about similar types of work are trying to use it for very much what Adrian discussed, right? You've got a large repository of documentation. Maybe there's specific knowledge tied to that documentation within a single user in the organization. You know, let's just make up something. John Smith, let's say, has been in an organization for 42 years. And John's about to retire and he knows everything about the company. Everybody comes to John. He's got all the information. What happens to all that information when John retires? You know, is there going to be a knowledge loss? Are people going to have to spend an exorbitant amount of time going back through all of his files and documentation? This tool and tools like it would help organizations like that go back through all the documentation that John had for 42 years. 
and they could say, hey, when was the time we did this type of project? When did we reference this type of information? And this tool that we're building would not just give you recommendations based on the type of work that John had done, but it would also give you the document name. It would give you the document location and you can click into that and it would show you in paragraph 14 on page 52, hmm. here's where that information is referenced by John, right? Without getting very far in the weeds, it would help you pull back that information very quickly. And you can say this article, yes, it pulled back that information. That's actually not relevant to what we're doing. But these other three articles that it did pull back, those are going to be helpful. So it's just a way to help clients work through searching content as well as content creation. There's some other tools that we're working on as well that would be more of like a chatbot style interface. Uh, what we're working with is some tools to use natural language to search a SQL database. Um, that sounds very complicated, but really at the surface, what we're trying to do is just have a communication like we're having right now, but to be able to query a database that way. So some use cases for that, you know, maybe you've got a help desk and that help desk processes a ton of tickets across a, a lot of companies or a lot of departments, whatever. They've got a ton of information related to the help desk. And maybe, you know, at any given time, you want to know how many priority two incidents have we had this month, this week, last year related to Microsoft outages in this area. Very specific conversations without having to have somebody get in there and write SQL, write code to find this. Mm -hmm. You could just talk to the interface, typing it in kind of like you would with a chat bot and it would return those results. Very powerful stuff. Yeah. Now, I don't want to take away from some of the work that we're doing with our reports, but this very niche questions that may come up may not be something that you've built a report to surface. Just went on spring break recently and we were on a cruise and I, I shared this with Adrian yesterday, kind of jokingly, but we were on a cruise and I really wished I had this functionality when I was on the boat. We were trying to book our next cruise and we were looking at some of the different ports we wanted to go to and different boats that we wanted to be on. And it was very complicated trying to sit down with the cruise line to talk through, we want to be on this type of boat, this type of room. We might need adjoining rooms, maybe on this floor of the boat. We might need a room with a bunk bed or a room that sleeps this many people across the entire fleet of ships. Some of those features we were checking are things that people knew to look for, but wasn't necessarily built into the user interface to search for. Very complicated. If we were able to just have a conversation like we did now, I could tell the interface, hey, I want a cruise leaving during this time frame. I want to ride on this class of ship. I want to be located near the dining room because I love to eat. I don't want to walk too far. <laughs> and I want some adjoining rooms with bunk beds that sleep this many people. That's very easy for us to convey very hard for some of the systems. This type of tool would have helped us with that. So I'm not going to lie as a fellow cruise head, because I love cruises as well. Um, that would certainly go a long way um, for every cruise line. Because imagine if if your search prompt in, in a cruise line website was really more of a, like you just mentioned, really more of a chat prompt box where you basically wrote exactly what you just laid out. And then the website went and found you the rooms based on your prompt. I mean, that would be very helpful. I, I certainly would find it more helpful than the current state of things, which is basically, these are the filters that we're going to allow you to look for cabin types, ship type, days at sea type, things of that nature, where you're trying to be very specific in the things that you need or that you want to have as, as somebody who's going on their next cruise. And so it's way better to explain it that way than to actually go through all those filters. Yeah. And I think it would help some of the application developers as well, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to think through every scenario. You let the tools and the data do the thinking. It'd be very powerful. We could even leverage that for you know, some of the manufacturing organizations we're working with. Some mm -hmm. companies, they've got a lot of different part numbers that are interchangeable. Those part numbers could be used in a number of different applications in a number of different industries. How powerful would it be for some of the distributors to be able to come to the manufacturer and say, 
hey, I need this type of part for this application without going through the drop downs, talking right. in a natural language to be able to produce that content. That'd be pretty powerful. I think the vacation topic is really fun and relatable for a lot of people because we think about AI and tech and we're always thinking about technical mm -hmm. implementations. Um, but there are a lot of use cases in our personal lives like this one, right? And I actually, one of our clients was sharing it. He planned his entire European vacation using chat GPT and was able to get a recommended agenda, some logistics, you know, traveling with particular interests or age groups, the size of the party, and was able to get very meaningful advice and feedback back. So it can scour all the sources that we would have had to do manually and one at a time, whether you use a particular yeah. website or TripAdvisor, or, you know, it's going to leverage all of those things at once and give you back a lot of information. But just to tie it back to work for a minute, we do this all the time. And our managed services and core technology division here at Mosher is also working on an implementation of this, right? So that they can very quickly have all of their consultants and technicians empowered with having that data at their fingertips. So they can ask questions like, how many servers are we managing for each individual operating system? How many Windows 2016 servers out there? What vulnerabilities came out? And now we know which ones that we need to go address or upgrade, et cetera. Or if they find a vulnerability with a particular software package and they can just very quickly ask, you know, which, which servers and which environments need to be addressed. Obviously all the data around tickets and help desks and how many how, you know, how long was this ticket open and how many by this particular agent, et cetera. And it's just a win-win situation like Cody described earlier, right? So not only does the end user, the person entering the prompt or asking the question get a win because they're getting that information and knowledge back very, very quickly where they might've had to wait hours, days, weeks, or even months at some of our clients where the IT department is just overburdened, right? Their data engineers can't get to that ticket. It's not a high priority, et cetera. So now they're going to have a wealth of information back to them in seconds, right? Or fractions of a second sometimes. So it also benefits whoever would have had to work that request, right? right. So now your data engineering team or whoever writes the SQL queries or would have had to create a report or a process, their workload will go down so they can focus on different things, right? So I think the sender and the receiver are both winning by leveraging this new technology. Yeah, absolutely. And how can businesses and organizations best prepare their workforce to adapt to and leverage AI technologies effectively? Yeah, I think there are a lot of paths that we can explore here. So the first one that comes to mind is change management. People are all over the spectrum with AI, right? There are people who are out there, they've been experimenting for 18 plus months, they're excited about this, etc. But we also know that that's not the majority of organizations. The Indiana Census Bureau put out some data that showed that only about 5% of organizations were actively using AI currently. And so we know a lot of people are slow to adopt. And we can just address, you know, what are, what are those reasons? Um, and how do we prepare for that? And so one is comfort level. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like people have become very comfortable with certain implementations of AI in their personal lives. So sometimes just drawing from those examples will take away a little bit of the unfamiliarity or discomfort. And we like to share examples of those things. A lot of us have iRobots vacuums in yeah. our homes. We use Amazon's Alexa the echo dot in our homes it's constantly you know interactive mm -hmm. and listening sometimes so um we use depending on your phone there's siri we use maps and navigation that will update in real time when there's an accident or traffic jam for whatever reason i don't know the best ones are probably netflix and oh, retail yeah. shopping right those so those are mm -hmm. machine learning recommendation engines under the hood what should i watch next on netflix yeah. so we're very comfortable with all of these tools. We've been using them for a long time. And now all of a sudden it's having such a, a shift and an impact at work and tying it back to like, hey, this is not that scary. Look, we're already doing a lot of these things in a different way. It goes a long way to make people feel a little bit more comfortable. On top of that, we can outline objection planning, right? What are the most common things that people have concerns about? and kind of address those one at a time, just get ahead of it. So we covered one of those today, right? It's going to replace my job. And so right. 
Well, that's that's actually not true, but it's going to empower your job. We've covered that in a lot of a lot of detail. I think also just sharing the positives, the opportunities, the ROI, some of that stuff will help. The next thing that I wanted to add was just promoting a culture of experimentation, right? Giving, making the tools available to people and the guidelines, the upskilling, the the training on how, how to use these, which tools can we use? How can we use them? But then encouraging people to try them out, share their success stories, maybe even create a reward system around those things like in your monthly touch points or your reviews, like how, you know, have you tried these things out? What challenges are you having? And sharing, making that a very collaborative and safe culture for people to try out and share what they're doing and how they're doing it. I can also just comment a little bit on just investing in the right tools and infrastructure and then getting those guardrails in place, right? And so not all companies have an AI governance policy in place yet, all these tools are available and I don't know that everybody understands what's necessarily happening. And so the big example right now would be you want to get your own private implementation of things. You don't want your company's confidential information or your client's confidential information, your employee's sensitive data going out to chat GPT or Google Bard or somewhere so that it's going into the public environment. So a little bit of education, a governance policy, just getting some basic guardrails in place. Kind of piggybacking off of what Adrian was saying around, you know, building that infrastructure. I think the first place to start from a tech perspective is to make sure that you have good quality data and a solid data foundation to start from. It's very hard to come in and just implement AI if you don't have quality data to start with. You're going to be training that AI on whatever garbage data you have currently, and it's going to give you garbage results, right? We always joke in the industry that it's trash in, trash out. We want to make sure that you have quality information, quality data to start with. I think once you get to that point, you're in a great position to start looking strategically at your AI adoption. We try to come at this, you know, from five different perspectives. I think the first one we typically look at is trying to define that AI strategy for an organization. What are you trying to be when you grow up from an AI perspective? How do we want to manage some of this from a company? What would be a success story, what would be considered a failure? Trying to understand some of that. Are there ethical or legal implications? And I think that's the first step. From there, we typically start talking about business use cases. You know where you want to go as a company. Now, where should we focus? And this is, I think, is where some companies should go. What are the business objectives? Have we done any research on use cases? Do we have the data to support those use cases? And kind of just using this as the next building block. From there, once we know where we want to go as a company, what use cases we're going to try to achieve, I think then we start looking at the architecture. Do we have the right AI tools in place? Do we need to go purchase tools? What type of model do we want to build? Really just trying to understand, you know, do we have tools in place? Are we going to build everything in one ecosystem? Are we going to use off-the-shelf tools? Are we going to work with a consulting company? This type of design and architecture, once you have those use cases, from there, you kind of build out your models, shape it out for these specific use cases, and then you can start looking at operationalizing these models. How do we put these into production with our existing information? How do we gather feedback from those models at play to know that it's actually providing the information we want? Very easily, you could get a model that somebody deployed that goes way off line, right? It, it could have different biases coming back. It could be providing the wrong prompts. It could be providing the wrong information. I read an article recently about a, I think it was a car dealership, and they had built a chatbot interface for somebody to interact with and say, you know, what was the best type of vehicle for my scenario? And I believe it was a Chevrolet dealership. So you would expect the Chevrolet dealership to say, hey, the Silverado is the best truck out there. You should come buy a Silverado. We'll get you this great deal on it. The chat bot didn't have the right parameters and it recommended a Ford F-150 oh. at the Chevrolet dealership. Very <laughs> much not what the Chevrolet dealership was looking for. <laughs> right? You need to retrain that model. Yes. In this scenario, we need to get that feedback. We need to improve that model and work on the feedback. So I think that's the next step. And then finally, we're going to be looking at the people in adoption, like Adrian mentioned. 
right? Trying to work through change management. How is this going to impact your daily life? Define roles and responsibilities, right? Who's doing what now? Adrian talked earlier about, you know, the different types of jobs and tasks. People may have different tasks in the future. Some of those tasks may be automated. Some of them may be delegated to, you know, different people within the organization. There may be new tasks to monitor these bots to make sure it's not recommending a Ford at a Chevy dealership, right? You could have all of that as well as training and support. So I think that's how I kind of see us preparing organizations for the future, starting with a solid data foundation and then walking through some of these stepping stones. I can add that Mojo has put together an AI strategy package for people who are interested. So like we said, 95-ish percent of organizations in Indiana have not really started this journey yet. And so if they're interested in having an assessment or setting a strategy and a roadmap for the future, that we offer services in that area and we have a framework. Cody highlighted some, some of the steps, a small piece of that package that's available. Yeah, I want to also highlight that we're not sponsored by Chevy nor Ford, but I think that example, Cody, about the car dealership exemplifies the model that you mentioned, trash in, trash out. If you don't have the right data set, the right information set within the AI tool, then that's what's going to happen. You're going to get somebody that's going to ask a question but they're going to get the wrong answer, or at least not the answer that you want them to get. In this case, specifically with the dealership example, that is a perfect, a perfect example of that. I saw another one with an airline where the chat bot gave somebody a, a full refund, or, you know, and a voucher for a future flight, et cetera, which was outside of the actual policy, right? So just keeping the information current and updated as policies change, et cetera, is going to be a whole new job function, right? That we have to constantly monitor, train, evaluate these tools. Yeah, absolutely. So before we go, I know we've mentioned some of it, but do you have any advice for someone who might be on the fence about incorporating AI to their work routine? Of course, if they're allowed to. Yeah, I have a few thoughts. One is just to stay informed, right? Take the time to learn about AI, its potential applications in your field, understanding how AI works and its benefits can help to alleviate any apprehensions that people or organizations might have. Second, I'd say start small. We can evaluate use cases with a very real ROI on kind of a, a small basis, right? Your first venture into AI doesn't have to be eight data scientists working on a big custom model that takes two years to implement. The industry has just come a long way in a really, really short period of time. So there are a lot of opportunities to capitalize on small wins with tangible benefits. Next, I would say keep an open mind. Um, be willing to explore new possibilities. It is a rapidly evolving field, so there may be opportunities to leverage AI in ways that you haven't considered before. And six months from now, that landscape will look entirely different. As the tech continues to grow, more tools are becoming available. Existing ones are maturing more use cases will be published and shared online. You can see a lot of things online for particular industries and spaces and tools, et cetera. So I would say keep reading and just be open to a field and a technology that's continuing to change very, very quickly. And another thought would just be to focus on value. So while AI is fun and exciting, we have a lot of executives saying, hey, our 2024 goal is to use AI. And it's not always a win to build something with AI just to say, hey, we used AI. Mm -hmm. So I would say select a project that saves time, increases efficiency, and provides a real value that people will appreciate and see in their daily lives and workflows. And this will garner a lot of enthusiasm and adoption. Just piggybacking off of what Adrian was saying, I'd say if we've got a person who's looking to get into AI and maybe it's not allowed in their you know corporate setting, maybe they don't have the means to do a big corporate initiative, I'd recommend staying small or starting small and focusing on personal productivity gains. There's a lot of different tools out there to help you just in your day-to-day -day life. You know, maybe it's thin work, maybe you're using this for you know, your own specific use case for generating content. Maybe you've got writer's block and you just need some creative idea to get you moving forward. Maybe you're using, you know, some sort of co-pilot tool to help you produce better looking PowerPoint presentations. That doesn't have to be a huge corporate initiative. You can get a free license for co-pilot and start 
building some of this out today. Or if you can't use any of this within your organization, start building that familiarity in your personal life. Adrian mentioned earlier, you know, the use of Roombas, right? We've got different assistants on your phones, whether it's a Google Assistant or Siri. Just getting that familiarity, that comfort using these tools and trying to find a way to incorporate it into your day-to-day life. Yeah, it's not like AI is, is new. I mean, we've had AI around us in some form or fashion over the last, I don't know, 10 years, maybe, maybe a little bit more. I mean, all the examples that Adrian mentioned on personal life use, something as simple as Netflix, like you were mentioning, just every time you log into the platform, it's going to tell you, hey, how about you watch this? Because you watched this other thing two months ago. Well, we just put up this new show. Why don't you watch that? Or Amazon, whenever you go to their website, if you purchase there a lot, it's going to bombard you the second you join their site again. It's going to say, hey, you bought this two weeks ago. How about if you want to buy this? So all those things are AI. It's one form of AI. It's basically telling you that because you chose this product two weeks ago, you should probably choose this one this time. And then there's many other things um, like like you mentioned, the personal assistants that came with our phones, you know, that really started coming on, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, eight years ago. And when you really think about it, people didn't really thought that it was AI. It was just, oh, it's, I don't want to say her name because I've got Mac products all around me right here, but it's her or it's Alexa with, with Amazon or Google, you know, with, with Google, you say, hey, Google and et cetera. So it's been around us. I think we're already comfortable with it. It's just the other ways that we can implement it now that we've got these tools that you can actually write prompts into and get answers within seconds that if you think about it, it took you it took you a little bit longer maybe with Google to get, but you didn't get answers that would make sense, that would be drilled down to exactly what you were asking for within seconds before. So great advice. I really like your thoughts, Adrian, on stay informed and and start small. I think those are very good. So with that, we'd like to thank both Adrian Watts and Cody Friend for being with us on Ask Anything today. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us. This has been another great conversation around AI, and we certainly appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening in to this week's edition of Ask Anything presented by Motion Consulting. We hope you enjoy listening to Adrian Watts and Cody Friend talk to us about how AI can enhance jobs and productivity. Join us next time when we continue to dive deeper with our resident experts and what they're currently working on. Remember to send us your ideas or topics via our social media feeds. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, so long, everybody. Go.